Hi everybody, Jacob Reed here from ReviewEcon.com. Today we're going to be talking about firms within perfectly competitive factor markets. If after watching this video, you still need a little more help, head over to ReviewEcon.com and pick up the Total Review Booklet. It has everything you need to know to ace your microeconomics or macroeconomics AP exams. Let's get into the content. So first, let's review the labor market for just a little bit. And remember, we're going to be focusing here on labor, but this actually is going to apply to other resources. So these same concepts can apply to the employment of physical capital and the employment of land as well. So here are some qualities of a perfectly competitive factor market. First, we're going to have many different businesses within this market competing for labor. And the workers within this market are going to be identical as far as their skills are concerned. We're also going to assume that there is perfect information and labor mobility. That means workers have knowledge of all their opportunities and can easily move from one opportunity to the other. And because of these qualities, firms within a perfectly competitive factor market are going to be wage takers. They are going to have no influence on the wage they pay their workers. Next, we're going to talk about the marginal resource cost for the firm. Here we have the market for labor and we have an equilibrium wage of $10. The marginal resource cost is also known as the marginal factor cost. You could see MRC or MFC on your exam. But whether you see marginal resource cost or marginal factor cost, it is the cost of hiring an additional unit of labor. And since firms in a perfectly competitive factor market pay the equilibrium wage for all workers they hire, the marginal resource cost is going to be equal to the wage. In this case, it's going to be $10. Let's take a look at the numbers to see what I'm talking about. Here we have the different quantities of labor a firm could hire, and we see that the wage is $10 for every unit of labor. The total resource cost is going to increase by $10 with each additional worker. And as a result, that marginal resource cost, which is the change in total cost, is going to be equal to the wage. So here's that market graph once again, and we have the equilibrium wage for labor at $10. And as we just saw, this firm can hire as many workers as it wants at that equilibrium wage of $10. That means that the equilibrium wage is going to move on over to the firm graph. So for firms in a perfectly competitive factor market, you're going to be drawing side-by-side -side graphs just like you did for firms with perfectly competitive product markets. So that $10 wage is going to come on over and create the marginal resource cost. That is the supply of labor for the firm. It's perfectly elastic because this firm can hire any quantity of labor at the equilibrium wage. And again, that marginal resource cost comes from the equilibrium wage from the market. Next, we're going to talk about the marginal revenue product. Marginal revenue product is the benefit of hiring an additional unit of labor. It's the money that is brought in as a result of selling the products that a new worker creates. The marginal revenue product is the marginal product times the marginal revenue. For most questions on your exam, the firm is likely selling their product in a perfectly competitive market. And if you remember in a perfectly competitive market, the marginal revenue is going to be equal to the price. A little side note, you could see the term value of the marginal product, that is the VMP, and that is the price times the marginal product. For a firm selling its output in a perfectly competitive market, the value of the marginal product and the marginal revenue product are the same. But the marginal revenue product is what we're focused on here. If we assume that the price of the product here and the marginal revenue are $20, then the marginal revenue is going to be $20 for all units produced. You times the marginal revenue of $20 by the marginal product for each of these workers hired, and that gives us the marginal revenue product of each of these workers. And with the marginal product and the marginal revenue product, we can see the different phases of the law of diminishing marginal returns, which means that the marginal product and the marginal revenue product are going to be the same shape. As marginal product increases, we are experiencing increasing marginal returns. Of course, that's because of specialization. Then diminishing marginal returns sets in and marginal product begins to fall for these workers. And eventually marginal product becomes negative and we get negative returns. And since we can see the same pattern in the marginal product as we see in the marginal revenue product, the marginal product and the marginal revenue product are the same shape. Here's our marginal product curve and here is our marginal revenue product curve. As I said, they're the same shape. And when it comes to the marginal revenue product, that is the highest wage that a firm would be willing to pay a particular worker. Obviously they'd like to pay less, but this is the maximum they would pay a worker. 
That third worker has a marginal revenue product of $70, and that's the maximum wage they'd be willing to pay for three workers. And since the marginal revenue product is the highest wage a firm would pay, the marginal revenue product is the firm's demand for labor. So there's our marginal revenue product curve again, and we are going to add that it is equal to demand. And since a firm will always hire workers as long as the marginal revenue product is increasing, I often do not even draw in that upward sloping portion of the demand curve. I just use the downward sloping portion. If your professor or teacher wants you to draw the upward sloping portion, you should do it. But that's why I don't, because they always would hire those workers. So when it comes to the profit maximizing quantity of labor that a firm is going to hire, we have a rule. The firm is going to hire the quantity of labor where the marginal revenue product equals the marginal resource cost. Once again, we're seeing an application of marginal analysis here. The marginal revenue product is the marginal benefit to a firm for hiring more workers. And the marginal resource cost is the marginal cost of hiring more workers. And as we've already learned, benefit maximizing behavior is where the marginal benefit equals the marginal cost. So let's try to figure out how many workers this firm will hire. The wage is $45 and that's why we have a marginal resource cost of $45 for this firm. And this firm is always going to hire those first few workers where the marginal revenue product is increasing. And then they will hire as long as the marginal revenue product is greater than or equal to the marginal resource cost. That third worker has a marginal revenue product of $70 and a marginal resource cost of $45. Hiring that worker makes sense because that marginal revenue product is greater than the marginal resource cost and it increases profit by $25. That fourth worker still has a marginal revenue product that is greater than the marginal resource cost, so they should hire them. And that's because hiring that worker will increase profit by $5. Now, as we mentioned before, the profit maximizing number is where the marginal revenue product and marginal resource cost are equal, but they are never equal in these numbers. But we will never hire when the marginal revenue product is less than the marginal resource cost. So if we take a look at that fifth worker, the marginal revenue product is only $30 and the marginal resource cost is greater than that at $45. Hiring that worker will decrease profit by $15. And so for this firm, the profit maximizing number of workers to hire is four workers. Getting back to our graph now, we're going to add in the marginal revenue product curve or the demand for labor. I usually don't draw in the upward sloping portion as you can see. And here at low quantities of labor, we are going to have our marginal revenue product being greater than the marginal resource cost. So this firm should keep on hiring. At high quantities of labor, the marginal revenue product is less than the marginal resource cost. So this firm should hire less. The profit maximizing number of workers is found at the intersection between the marginal revenue product and marginal resource cost curve. Drop down below, we've got QF. That's the quantity of workers this firm will hire because that's where MRP equals MRC. Now, of course, we can have changes in this graph. If we have a change within the market, that is going to move the firm's marginal resource cost. Let's say the market, but not the firm, have an increase in the demand for labor. That's going to shift that demand curve to the right. We're going to see the equilibrium wage and equilibrium quantity of workers increase. And that wage is going to go on over to the firm graph and become a new higher supply or marginal resource cost. And now we have a new MR equals MC point. That means we have a lower quantity of labor that's going to be hired. You could be asked what happened to the marginal revenue product of the last worker hired as a result of the change in the wage. Well, the marginal revenue product of the last worker has increased, and that's because we are now hiring fewer workers and we are on a higher point on the marginal revenue product curve. QF1 has a higher marginal revenue product than QF. If instead we saw an increase in the supply of labor, that's going to drive the equilibrium wage downward. That new lower wage is going to shift that marginal resource cost downward for the firm, and that's going to result in a higher profit maximizing quantity of labor. And now at this new higher quantity of labor, we have a decreased marginal revenue product for the last worker hired. And that's because at QF1, we are at a lower point on the marginal revenue product curve. You could see changes that only impact the firm. Perhaps we have an increase in the productivity of just the firm's workers. That's going to shift the demand for labor, but only for this particular firm. An increase in productivity will shift the marginal revenue product for the firm to the right, and that's going to increase in a higher profit maximizing quantity where MRP equals MRC. And with this change, the marginal revenue product of the last worker hired 
didn't change. And that's because the marginal revenue product of the last worker hired is always going to be equal to the wage. And since the wage didn't change, neither did the marginal revenue product of the last worker hired. Now we're going to shift gears just a little bit and we're going to talk about combinations of resources that can be used to produce products. And if you remember back to unit one when you learned about utility maximizing combinations, this is going to be just like that. But now we're talking about resources that can be used to make products. A firm might be trying to decide how much labor they should use to produce their product and how much capital they should use to make their product. You're going to take the marginal revenue product of the resource and divide it by the price of that resource to give you a marginal product per dollar ratio. Let's assume that the marginal product of labor is 45 and the price of labor is $15. The marginal product of capital, on the other hand, is 100 units, while the price of capital is $50. If we take the marginal product for labor and divide it by the price of labor, we get three units of output per dollar spent on labor. And for physical capital, the marginal product divided by the price is two units of output per dollar spent on capital. And that brings us to the least cost combination rule. The least cost combination is the marginal product of labor divided by the price of labor should equal the marginal product of capital divided by the price of capital. They aren't equal here. So the question is, which one should they employ more of? As they employ more of one of these resources, the marginal product per dollar is going to decrease. And as they employ less units of a particular resource, the marginal product per dollar is going to increase. And so if we want to make these two equal and bring them closer to the least cost combination of resources, we want less capital to be employed and more labor to be employed. And that's because three units per dollar is greater than two units per dollar. You could also see the profit maximizing combination rule as well. And that is the marginal revenue product of labor divided by the price of labor will equal the marginal revenue product of capital divided by the price of capital. So let's get back to the example we just had and find the profit maximizing combination of labor and capital. If the marginal revenue of this product is $10, then we're gonna just multiply the marginal product by 10. So the marginal revenue product is $450 and the price of labor is $15. The marginal revenue product of capital, on the other hand, is $1,000 and the price of capital is still $50. And when we plug in the numbers and do the math, we find that there is $30 worth of marginal revenue product per dollar spent on labor and there is $20 worth of marginal revenue product per dollar spent on capital. And so to increase profit, we would still want to employ less capital and more labor. Of course, you could see questions on your exam where you have to use some algebra and work backwards. It's going to happen at some point. And let's see if we can do that with a firm that is already employing the least cost combination of resources. And that means that the marginal product divided by the price of labor already equals the marginal product divided by the price capital. If we know that the marginal product of labor is 75 and the price of labor is $15, while the marginal product of capital is 125, we could use algebra to find the price of physical capital here. Plug in the numbers that we know and we can solve for X here. If we do the math, we see that the marginal product per dollar for labor is five, which means that the marginal product per dollar for capital must also be five. 125 divided by five gives us a $25 price for capital. And there you have it. That is everything you need to know about perfectly competitive factor market firms. If you still need a little more help, head over to reviewecon.com where there's lots of games and activities to help you practice the skills you need to ace your microeconomics or macroeconomics exams. That's it for now. I'll see you all next time.